Hello, my name is Hugo Cornelis, and I really like to talk about performance tuning on SQL Server. But that's not my only passion. I have a background in database design, and in this series of videos, I will try to explain database design in such a way that it is finally easy to understand for everyone. So when we talk about database design, then a large part of that is, of course, normalization. And people often think, why does normalization even matter? Why do we have to spend time on that? I mean, people think that normalization is boring, but it, it really isn't. Normalization can be fun when explained the right way. It can be explained in a boring way, like basically every topic, but I'm going to try to make it fun. Normalization is also said to be hard. Well, I'm sorry, it isn't. Normalization is actually quite easy. The big problem is that many academics seem to make it a sport to make the explanations as boring and as hard to understand as possible. I mean, just talk about tables and columns and they will touch at you and tell you no 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 a table is not a table it's a relation and you should use the term attribute instead of column well those terms do have their value they do have their place in an academic discussion but we are just trying to build a database to support our customers. We will eventually implement tables and columns. So let's just keep it easy. In this course, I will talk about tables and columns and all the academics can tut at me as much as they want. I'm going to do this my way. So there's one more objection that I sometimes hear against normalization and that it's, it's not important. Why bother with, with that? We don't need it. Well, I hope that during this course I will show you sufficient examples of the effect of an unnormalized database that you will start to see that normalization is, in fact, very important. And the main reason we want to normalize our database design is to prevent incorrect data. Is that the right term on the slide? Well, actually, no. People often say that normalization and correct database design prevents incorrect data. I consider that misleading. Um, so let's say that I go to a dating website and I set up my own profile. For the record, I am happily married. I have no ambitions to meet new life partners. This is just a theoretic example for the sake of it. But of course, if I do go to such a website, I want to meet lots of women. So I, of course, upload a very representative picture of myself. Um, wait, this works better if I disable the webcam for a while. So this is me, obviously. Completely true, honest, really not any lie. Now, how would any database or any application ever prevent me from uploading this picture and claiming it is me. Of course, I need to be consistent about it. I need to lie thoroughly. If I enter my real birth date or my real hobbies, then it is immediately clear that this cannot be me. But if I am consistent, then the incorrect data cannot be prevented, as long as I keep my webcam off, of course. However, what a database, and more generally, generally an application can do, is prevent data that is impossible, inconsistent, or in violation of business rules. So let's give some examples. Um, let's say that I enter my birth date and I type in February 29, 1967. That is impossible because 1967 is not a leap year, so there is no February 29 in 1967. Just by defining the correct data type for the column, we already prevent that. 
that is a very basic example of impossible data that can be prevented for free just by designing your database properly. An example of inconsistent data would be when I enter my birth date as somewhere in the year 2000. For the record, this video is recorded in 2023, so that would make me 23 years of age. And I would also specify that I have two children and five grandchildren. The two children is still a possibility at 20 years of age. Five grandchildren is impossible. So there we have an inconsistency between the birth date and the number of grandchildren. The database can prevent that when the design has seen to that. And finally, let's say that I make a profile where I enter my birth date as some date in 2010. That would make me 13. Dating websites usually have a rule that you have to be at least 18 to make a profile, so that birthday would be a violation of business rules and my application should be um, refused. And the database should refuse to store that uh, data that violates the business rules. All of those checks are basically given for free if you model your database correctly. And that is why normalization is very important. So in the rest of this video, I will present a few terms and try to explain them. Terms that I will use throughout the rest of this series. So let's start with the universe of discourse. I often use this term to limit the scope of what we're talking about. The universe of discourse is basically a subset of reality, not the entire reality as it is seen by the business. And there are two important uh, elements in this definition, the subset and seen by the business. Let's start with the subset. So I say that the universe is a subset of reality because when I work for a customer, I am not supposed to create a database model to capture the entire world. Of course, during talks at the coffee maker, it is perfectly okay to talk about last week's uh, football games. But unless my customer happens to be the football league, that discussion about football games is irrelevant to the work. If I am designing a system for, for instance, um, an insurer, then the talk about the football is irrelevant. And as soon as we are back to business, we should talk about everything related to insurances. Uh, in the recent years, this scoping to, a sub, to the subset of only the important information has become more and more important. With all the focus on privacy, data protection, we really don't want to collect data that we don't need because it is data that might already be protected by several laws or maybe new laws will protect it in the future and give us a lot of work to deal properly with that data, even though we don't need it. So always scope your work to only the data that the business needs. And on the slide you will see subset of reality or of a virtual reality. I added that because sometimes you might be hired by a gaming company to design a database for their next virtual game, uh, gaming platform. Then you are going to design a data model, data model set in a reality where magic exists, where people randomly kill each other and then respawn 20 seconds later. That's not our world, but that's the world you are modeling then. Now the last part of the, this definition is as it is seen by the business. And this may be a bit contentious. I know that there are people who are still against same-sex marriage. Let's say I am hired by a wedding photographer and this wedding photographer has a view that marriage, is, marriage should be between man and woman only and he refuses to do business with same-sex couples. Now, I can have an opinion on that, and I can even share my opinion with the, uh, with the business, uh, tell them that 
I believe they could make more money if they have a more open-minded view towards reality as it is now. But at the end of the day, it's their business, not mine. And they decide how they want to do business, not me. So at the end of the day, if they insist on only serving uh, mixed marriages, then I have just two options left. Either fire the client and walk out, or continue working for them and create a data model that reflects their reality. No same-sex marriage. I cannot accept their money and then give them something that they didn't ask for. So it is very important that you always stick to how the business sees reality. And of course you can warn about things when you think this isn't very smart, but in the end you have to accept the decision of the business because they know best how to do their business. I know best how to design a database. That's why they hire me. Once you understand what a universe of discourse or UOD is, then the last uh, sentence is very uh, elementary. If it's not a universe of discourse, we don't care. Again, water cooler discussions are completely fine, but once we, once we are working on the data model, we should stick to the universe of discourse for that customer and that assignment. The next term I want to define is functional dependency, or FD for short. We say that one column is functionally dependent on another column, or we can also say that the column depends on the other column. Or we can reverse it and say column A determines column B, which can be written with an arrowhead for short. All of these ways to phrase it mean the same thing. They mean that for every possible value of column A, there is at most one value for column B. Never more than one. No values is okay. One value is okay. Two or more. No. If that can happen, then it's not functional dependency. So let's give an example to illustrate this. Let's say... I'm creating a data model for a conference, and this conference wants a data model to capture a point in time. No history, I'm going to keep the example simple. They want to capture a given point in time where all the attendees are. In that universe of discourse, I can say that the chair number determines the name. Because, think about it. You can give me a chair number, let's say 205. I can walk through the room and search chair 205. Maybe there is no chair with that number, then I will never get an attendee name. Maybe there is a chair 205, but it's empty, then I will never get an attendee name either. Or maybe it's occupied, then there will be an attendee sitting on that chair and I can ask their name, and then I have one attendee name. But I can never have two, because there will never be two attendees in the same chair. At least not in the type of conference that I am going to talk about in this family-friendly video. And because we only have a single attendee on a chair, we can also say that the chair number determines the birth date. Give me the chair number, I can find who is on that chair, and either there is nobody, or there's someone, and that someone has exactly one birth date. However, we cannot say that the name determines the birth date. Why not? Because you can give me a name, John Williams. I can go through the room and find if there is someone named John Williams. But what if there are two people with that name, with different birth dates? That may be improbable, but not impossible. And a functional dependency has to be true always, with no exceptions. Here there might be exceptions, so there is no functional dependency of birth date on name. 
We talked about simple functional dependencies, but functional dependencies can also be composite. That happens when a specific combination of two or even more columns determines another column. So, for example, um, let's stick with the conference example, but now they are expanding and they have a larger venue with multiple rooms. And in each room, the chair numbers are numbered from 1, 2, 3, etc. Now, the dependency chair number determines name is no longer true, because chair number 5 in room A will have a different attendee than chair number 5 in room B. So, if you just give me chair number 5, I cannot guarantee that I will give you only one name. That functional dependency no longer exists. But there is now a new functional dependency of the combination of room number and chair number on name. Because if you ask me who, what is the name of the attendee in chair 5 in room B, well, that is once more just a single attendee or none. And I will have a single name or none, but never two names. So this is an example of a composite functional dependency. Then, once you are looking at composite functional dependencies, you will find that if you take the definition very literally, you will find lots and lots and lots of them, but most of them are, let's say, cheating. Let's stick with the example we had. We know that if the combination, that given the combination of room number and chair number, we find just a single attendee, so we have a functional dependency where that combination determines the name then I can also say that the combination of room number, chair number, and birth date determines the name. Because I can ask you, go to room B, chair 5, and if their birth date is October 1st, 1990, then ask their name. Again, you will get no names or one name, but never more. But that's a bit obvious because we already knew that just room number and chair number leads to one attendee and hence one name. So this is kind of a cheating composite functional dependency and we really are not interested in those cheaters. Now the official name, if you are going to look at literature about database de design and functional dependencies, is a partial functional dependency as opposed to the full functional dependency that I just call a real functional dependency. For the record, in the rest of this entire series, we will talk about only real functional dependencies. Those cheaters are completely irrelevant for everything we are going to do. So when I talk about functional dependencies in the rest of those videos, I'm talking about the real non-cheater or officially full functionally, functional dependencies. Now, when you know that the combination of A and B can determine C, a composite functional dependency, you might wonder whether it can also be the other way around. Just column A determines the combination of B and C. And yes, that can happen. But it turns out that when this is the case, it is exactly equivalent to just saying A determines B. Oh, and A also determines C, two separate simple functional dependencies. So this type of functional dependency is never used. We always um, separate it out into the parts A determines B and A determines C. Obviously, in exactly the same way, if the combination of A and B determines the combination of C and D, then we can separate out the right part and say the combination of A and B determines C, and that same combination also determines D. We cannot separate out the left part of this functional dependency. Now, the problem with functional dependencies is we actually do need them all if you want a correct database design. If you miss one or a few or if you have some incorrect, then you will get an incorrect database design. So it's very important to have them all. The problem there is 99% are insanely obvious and you instantly see them. It's the remaining 1% that can get you. Now, within the scope of this video series, I do not have time to talk about that at length, but 
several years ago, I recorded a course for Pluralsight uh, where I did describe a step-by-step -step procedure that if you follow it precisely, guarantees that you will find all functional dependencies. The link to that course will, of course, also be in the description below this video. The next term we need to define is candidate key. A candidate key is always defined within a table. And there are many methods that all have their own way to write down the table design. I like to use a method where I just write all the columns in a row. The reason for this is that using this method to write the design for a table allows me to just add sample data below it. And you can instantly see the five rows of sample data that I have added to this table design. And that sample data can be used to talk about things, to visualize things, to explain things, to make things simpler. Because in my experience, concrete examples make the world simpler. A candidate key, to return to the subject, is a column or a combination of columns within a table that determines every other column in that same table. So, if you look at the sample data, and if you think about the data model of a conference, you will probably assume that the badge number determines the room, the chair, and the name. That's quite obvious. Give me a badge number and I can find the employee with that badge and ask the name and look where they are sitting. You can also visualize this in the data by adding an extra row and checking would this be a, a valid population. And of course it would not be. We cannot have both Catherine and Hugo with the same badge number. We cannot have people with the same badge number in different rooms on different chair that would be invalid, it's a violation of business rules. And in my way of writing down the data model, I then put an arrow over the uh, key column. So this arrow means that the badge number column is a candidate key. And you can read that as, there should never be duplicates below me. It's the easy way to understand what the arrow means. Just look at the arrow, look at the data underneath, and if there are duplicates there, the data is in violation of a business rule, or you chose the wrong key. Now, if you look at the other columns, you can already see in the sample uh, data that it's perfectly valid to have multiple attendees in room B. So, room is not a candidate key. We can also have multiple uh, people in chair 24, because we have multiple rooms that each have their own chair 24. The sample data does not have duplicate names, but we can add some extra sample data. We can add an extra row with a new attendee, put him in chair B20, and he is called William. Now we have two people named William. That, once more, may not be very common in a small conference, on a larger conference, you should expect it always. But it can happen, no matter how small the conference, you can have two different people called William. So this is also valid, a name is not a candidate key. But we should not just look at single columns. We also have those composite functional dependencies that can result in composite candidate keys. For instance, if we move second William to chair 24 in room B, then he is in the same chair as André. And I happen to know André and William. They are very good friends, but not that good. They will not sit on each other's lap. So this is an invalid population, and the combination of room and chair is a candidate key for this table. So we see immediately Two candidate keys in one table. Yes, that can happen. Many candidate, many tables have just one candidate key, but there can be more than one. If that happens, then at one point we will have to choose one to be the primary key, and all the rest are alternate keys. 
Now, during database design, this distinction between primary key and alternate keys is actually not that relevant. So this is usually a choice we can postpone until we are ready to implement the data model in our chosen relational database management system. If, for instance, we choose SQL Server, and I think these terms are the same in many DBMSs, then we could use the primary key constraint for the primary key, the unique constraint, or a unique index for all the alternate keys. We should enforce them, because that way the database will help us protect against inconsistent uh, uh, data or data that violates the business rules or data that is simply impossible. That concludes the basics of relational database design. The next video will talk about the first normal form. Yes, in December 2023, if everything goes according to plan, I will finally start the actual process of normalization. I hope to see you then. If you cannot wait that long, or if you want to have a way more in-depth coverage, including a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to find functional dependencies, again, the link is below. My plural site uh, course on relational database design covers that all way more extensive than this series will ever do. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please click the like button, subscribe to get uh, information when there is more videos. Leave a comment if you saw something worth commenting. My name is Hugo Canedes. I thank you for your attention.